Welcome from Israel, creative genius and the Jewish people's digital ambassador, Halal Fold. Welcome, Halal. Thank you so much. I see Brett left. I wanted to thank him for his clear moral voice, something that is so rare today. And it's like, I listened to him and I'm like, how, what, why doesn't everyone agree? Like, you know, on, on October, October 8th, I said to myself, finally, the world will finally see clearly what is good and what is evil. And here we are, you know, so please pass on the message to him that I, I thank him for his clear moral uh, compass and, and just voice. It's really, oh, really, really oh. rare today. I'll make sure I text him afterwards. And, you know, to his point, I, you know, it's hard to be reminded of, of these dark moments, but I think he has a great point. And I'm actually going to get a little plaque and it's going to, it's going to say, remember, and, and I'm going to put October 8th um, because it's changed my life forever. So send me one. All right. Maybe we can brand it together. There you go. So Hillel, tell us what were you doing in Israel before the war began and how it looks different now? So uh, just a little background. I'm from New York originally, moved here uh, to Israel as a kid with my family. Um, hardcore Zionist. I know it's a dirty word today, Zionism, but uh, proud of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I finished school here. I went to the military. I studied political science in bar -Ilan University. And I started uh, writing on the internet. Uh, today, we have a word. It's called a blog. At the time, that was not a word. And I sure as heck didn't have any business model. It wasn't a thing. All the things that we know today, social media and the iPhone, like this stuff didn't exist. Um, and I, I literally had thoughts of uh, tech and I started to write them down and pretty quickly entrepreneurs start to reach out to me and I would meet these entrepreneurs and I would try to help, you know, I, I don't want to generalize too much, but at the time, uh, many Israeli entrepreneurs were phenomenal at building tech, but when it came to building business, not so much. And so I would just, you know, try to help. And, uh, long story short, over the next 10 to 15 years, many entrepreneurs came back to me and said, listen, you know, you helped us early on, let's work together. And so I built this portfolio of companies that I work with, uh, from small startups to, you know, venture capital firms to Google, Oracle, Microsoft, and many others. And, you know, I work on marketing and growth and things like that. Uh, I wear a columnist hat. I write for a lot of the leading tech publications, TechCrunch, The Next Web, VentureBeat, Inc., Entrepreneur, Fast Company, those guys. Um, a lot of public speaking about Israel, about entrepreneurship, about how Israel became this technology, you know, miracle. Um, and uh, basically, I'm a kid in the candy store, you know, you get to meet the most amazing people every day and just showcase Israeli tech. Um, and then everything changed on October 7th. Uh, you know, I found myself in synagogue and as we all did. And um, I feel in a very serious, authentic way that everything I've done till today uh, has brought me to here, to what I really am supposed to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to make any big declarations that I'm not going back to tech, but I, I definitely do not feel that I could bring the impact that I'm bringing now in the world of technology. So I'm going to have to figure it out after this all ends. Yeah, well, you're doing some amazing things, and we we all appreciate it. So, tell us about Ari, your brother, of blessed memory. What what happened to him, and what did you learn about the power of social media from your family's tragedy? So, about five years and two months ago, uh, Sunday morning, I'm at, I'm at the uh, startup's office in Jerusalem, and I'm doing my thing. And in between tasks, I open up, you know, Ynet, Israeli news, and I see that there was a terrorist attack in Gush Etzion, 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem, which is where Ari lives, lived with his family. Um, and so you do what you do. And, you know, you ask in the fold family WhatsApp group, is everyone okay? The smiley face. And, you know, you, you don't, it's, one of, it's not going to happen to me. Right. Uh, but uh, my older brother, Donnie, called me and he said, it's, he said two words to me that, uh, you know, those of us that remember burning discs, you remember when we used to burn CDs. So those yeah. two words are unfortunately burned on my mind. And I don't think I'll ever uh, forget them. And he said, it's him. It's him. Who, what are you talking about? It took me a second, but then I obviously understood and I, you know, got to the car and started driving like a maniac to the to the uh, hospital, to Shari Tzedek, and, uh, and then he called me again and said, don't rush. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we lost my older brother Ari to a terrorist attack. A Palestinian kid was just, you know, I guess just hungry for Jewish blood. Um, and, uh, you know, he left many, many legacies, really many, many legacies. Uh, first and foremost, the uh, you know, the zero tolerance for lies, right? He, there's, we all know this, right? That our world is, is a world of lies. And we all just accept these narratives. Oh, okay, well, let's just say, you know, you occupied a Pal an Arab Palestinian state. Okay, the world accepts it. It must be true, right? Well, Ari didn't have tolerance for that. So he stood, you know, he stood up for truth. But when it comes to your question, when it comes to social media, you know, he was one man with a keyboard and he he influenced, you know, 
for sure millions. I don't know how to quantify that, but I'm, you know, five years later, still getting stories of people who say to me, oh, you are, you know, your brother already changed my life. And I say, oh, you were good friends with him? No, I never met him. I'm like, oh, so you spoke to him like, you know, over, over the internet or on the phone? Oh, no, never spoke to him. What? Uh, so what he taught me is that the impact that a human being can have is really infinite. Um, and, you know, uh, in a way I'm, you know, channeling him in this war and doing my best, but, you know, on a very practical, um, you know, tactical level, let's call it. Uh, many people, even today, even in, during this war, are saying to me, well, what are you, you know, what are you bothering? No one's, you know, these anti-Semites are not listening to you anyway, right? You're, you're, you're in an echo chamber. What's the point? And Ari really taught me something that I use and I implement every day, which is it's not about that person. Right? If that person's not listening, let them not listen. But there are people watching this dialogue. There are people watching from the sidelines that are on the fence and they want to see the truth. And if you don't speak the truth, then the lies win. And so that's what I try to do. Obviously, within you know uh, finite resources, I'm one person, so I don't engage with you know crazy anti semites. Who, you know, but I do my best. Um, I'm not going to pretend that it's manageable in any way, shape, or form. Every time I you know post something on Twitter, I'm getting seventy thousand Heil Hitler replies. Um, but I'm trying my best, and uh, you know I'm I'm proud to say that my tweets and my posts, uh, whether it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all of them, have reached hundreds of millions of people. My my tweets alone. Uh, last time I checked a couple of days ago, I've reached 148 million people. I'm sorry, 148 million impressions. Let me be accurate uh, in 28 days, which is a number that I could not fathom before this war. And so, and, and and it's not even the impressions. That's the truth. It really isn't the impressions. It's about the messages that I'm getting from people saying, I had no idea. I just did not know what I, I you know, and these people have strong opinions and they have no knowledge. And so if I can educate these people, and again, it's a specific group of people, not everyone's open to be educated, but if a person is, and I'm providing and making facts accessible to them, then it's a win. And that seems to be uh, the trend that I'm seeing. It, I really do believe that we, not me, we, you know, the people that are, are are busy with Israel advocacy online all day long are are changing opinions, and you know, it's working. Again, we have a we have a we have a big war to fight uh, the digital battlefield, but but there are opinions that are being changed. We do. Well, your brother would be very proud of you and carry on his legacy and what he's doing today. Um, can you start just explain to us like what is the digital battlefield right now and which social media platforms are the true players and who are there who's the audience so first of all i want to say that you know it's become a cliche it's like oh you know there's the the physical the military battlefield and there's a digital battlefield and they're equally important and people are like they're not really are they really equally important like i mean people are and i you know i don't want to belittle god forbid our soldiers that are on the front lines i'm not in any way comparing me to them but i am saying that it's not about necessarily about the impressions or whatever it is. It's about public opinion. And it, and it, it manifests in a very, very real way. For example, and this is, you know, this is an actual case study that happened, the hospital, right? So I have access to information in real time before the news, before anything. And I knew that there was a hospital that was bombed in Gaza. And I knew that there were casualties. And I knew it wasn't the IDF. I knew it, like fact, 100%. And so I went to Twitter, X, and I said, heads up. In about a half an hour, you're going to hear about a hospital bombing, and you're going to hear about casualties, and you're going to be told it was Israel. It was in Israel. And that tweet got, I don't know, last I checked, I think 12 million impressions. So when that news came out and when the propaganda machine kicked into action and was telling everyone that it was Israel, there were 12 million people, whatever amount of people, that had saw that tweet and were prepared, and they already knew that it was propaganda they were being fed and did not believe that story, right? So – it's still, you know, escalated to where it escalated, you know, at the end, we, everyone now understands it wasn't Israel. But, you know, I do believe that those people who saw that original tweet of mine really changed their opinion, right? When, when they heard the news, they were, they had, they had already gotten a heads up that it was going to come out and it was a lie. And so these are the kind of things that I think are really, really impactful. And so what I'm doing, my personal mission, and I'm sticking to this mission 100%, which means that I'm saying no to anything else. My mission is twofold. It's one, to get out accurate and this is i cannot stress that enough because one inaccurate you know tweet or one quote unquote fake news and my credibility goes out the window so i'm trying very very hard to make sure it's 100 percent accurate as close to as real time as possible right and so you know i've been sent videos that i had no reason to believe they were not true but i had no way to verify that they were and i didn't tweet them despite the fact that they were very impactful videos um and so that's that's you know the first part of my mission and the second part of my mission which i think is even maybe more important is to spread hope and optimism because we are as a, as a people, you know, in deep, deep mourning and despair, and we are devastated. And, you know, it's very hard to see the cup half full right now, but I think perspective is 
incredibly important right now. And, you know, perspective doesn't mean let's belittle the loss, right? No one belittles the loss. The morning is the morning. But we have to remember that, you know, we celebrate Purim, right? Like the holiday of Purim. We get dressed up. We we celebrate. I don't know about you, but I never thought about that. Like, I know the story, but did you think about the fact that that was the closest to a genocide of the Jewish people? We Like, the, the strongest king in the world called for genocide of the Jewish people. And here we are celebrating. At the time, if I would have told you we were going to, you would have been, what are you talking? We can't celebrate this. This is horrible. This is a tragedy. And so I know that we're going to win this because we always do and we always have and we always will. And I know that Hamas will be no more, just like the ancient Greeks are no more and the ancient Egyptians are no more and the ancient Romans are no more and the Nazis are no more. And we're here, right? Hamas will be no more and we will win this. And and yes, I'm, I, this, this is a very hard sentence to say, but we will celebrate. We will celebrate again as a nation. I have zero doubt about that. And so that's a message that I'm trying to convey to my followers um, and try to spread positivity, trying to spread unity, trying to spread light. And again, for me, the messages that I'm getting from people really touch my heart and give me the fuel to continue. And, you know, people need hope right now. People really need hope. And so I'm trying my best to give people hope. Well, you're doing, you're doing amazing. Keep it up. The, um, you. you know, obviously X is a, a, a big pro- 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 proportion of what you're doing. Can you rank the social media platforms as far as impact, reach, and, you know, if people were to focus on, you know, their social media platforms, how, how would you encourage them to, what would you encourage them to do on which platforms? So I don't know that there's a right answer to that question. I think it depends on, you know, every person and where they're strongest. Uh, I've broken all my rules, quote unquote. I, I don't, I've never in my life posted anything about Israel on LinkedIn pre-war. Now I'm only posting, I'm not posting any business, like even even business content that is some connection to the war, I'm not even going there. I'm like pure Israel advocacy on all my platforms. Um, for me, you know, X is exponentially bigger than the other ones um, in every metric that you want to measure. Um, but but again, I'm get, like, you know, if if we're talking about, you know, numbers. So X, I said, like, I think it was 148 million impressions, I think, in the last 28 days. Um, LinkedIn, I think, was 6 million. Facebook's about 4 million. Instagram's about, I think, 7 million. Uh, so, you know, to me, it's clearly uh, X is, you know, way, way more impactful than any of the others, but it, it, it really does depend on a person and where there's st- some people LinkedIn is their strongest, you know, uh, and, and, I'm, and I also, I'm not sure that I can't judge someone that says I, I my LinkedIn is a professional thing. I'm not going to talk about, okay, that's, that's, that's their prerogative. For me, this, you know, this war and our survival and, you know, the, the current state of affairs and is more important than anything. So um, for me, it's absolutely X. And I think, um, you know, if someone, let's say, is not uh, active on social media and they want to start for this war, then then X is the place to go. Not only because that's where the discussion is happening, but it's also the lowest barrier to entry, right? I mean, you, you just, it's literally, you know, you just write your thought. You just write your thought and tweet it, you know? No, you don't, of course, you could add graphics if you want to, but it could be simple thoughts. I have a thought, post it. And, you know, it's, it's a really important uh, point to emphasize, which is that many people say, but I don't have any followers. Who's going to see my stuff? That's not how this works. OK, and I always give the example of the, the the famous plane picture on the Hudson. When the plane landed on the Hudson, everyone saw that picture. Everyone saw that picture. But no one asked themselves who who actually took that picture. Well, the guy who took that picture was the guy on the rescue team. And he had zero, like no followers. And it got like 90 million views before CNN even knew there was a plane crash because it was the content that went viral. It's not about the person. So you could have one follower. But if you tweet something very impactful, right, and very meaningful and very compelling, then you know, a small person like me or a big person like Oprah can retweet you and then it's game over. So it's really not about the, the, the number of followers. It's about sharing thoughts in a, in a cohesive and a uh, structured way that, that it's easy for people to consume because we have to know how people behave on social media. They don't, nobody has attention spans. You got to get to the point, concise, accurate, and, and say what needs to be said in a clear and concise manner. And, and again, obviously we're all on the same page here. Moral clarity is the most important thing. Uh, even though sometimes, you know, what are we going to do? It's not as sexy. It doesn't get as many clicks, but that's how, that is how we're going to win, right? I mean, we're not going to win the numbers game. We'll, we'll never win the numbers game. I mean, many years ago, Peter Lerner, who used to be the spokesman of the IDF, called me to his office, I think it was like eight years ago. And he asked me the question. He said, how are we going to win? The, how are we going to win the Twitter war? How are we going to win? And I said, I don't know what you mean by win. You think we're going to win the numbers game? We'll never win the numbers game. You think we're going to reach, you know, what they reach when they can share AI generated images and have zero desire to stick to the truth or we have to stick to the truth. We're not going to win that game, but I don't think that that's victory. I think victory is sticking to the truth. You know, at the end of the day, I don't know when the end of the day is, but people are going to realize that good 
is going to triumph over evil and truth will prevail. And I know that's, you know, a cliche, but there's a, there's a reason things become a cliche. It's because they're true. And we will win this. We win this on the physical battlefield. We will win this on the digital battlefield. But the question is, you know, the hurdles we have to go through to get there. Yeah, it's going to be painful, but we will win for sure. Well, I think that's a great point that X is the lowest barrier of entry and the easiest for obviously people to get into and start doing something. So it's great to hear that. So I know you've you've mentioned impressions and on all these platforms. It sounds like X is far superior, but you're still doing a you know uh, quite a good job on these other platforms as well. Besides impressions, how are you measuring your impact of what you're doing on social media? I mean, it's a good question. I think that's a that's a that's a good question. Nothing irrelevant of the war, right? I mean, that's every marketer has to face that question. How do you quantify social media, right? Um, you know, there are many ways I can do it. I mean, it's, you know, it's comments that I'm getting, it's messages, private messages that I'm getting something that really warmed my heart the other day. Uh, I was feeling, I had a moment, I was having a moment, right? We all have our moments and I was having a, a moment. I was not in a good place and I felt very alone. I really, like, I was just looking at my Twitter feed and I'm like, oh my God, like I am alone. And I, and I took to Twitter and I said, guys, like Jewish people around the world feel alone. We feel alone, but I know that we're not alone. I know in my brain that we're not alone, but my heart, I feel alone. If you stand unequivocally with Israel, please just reply to this tweet with the word me or an Israeli flag. And I put that out there on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I, I don't think I've ever had a tweet. I've never had a tweet that, that I mean, I think it's like I, this morning was at 15,000 me's. 15,000 people replied to that tweet with me, which uh, that's not millions and it's anecdotal. I get it. But, you know, and, and, you know, I get the whole echo chamber thing. I understand. But at the end of the day, I am changing people's opinions. I know because people write me and, I, and I'm very focused on spreading accurate information, you know, and I'm very focused on debunking the lies. I put out a video today and I said, all right, let's go one by one. Let's go down this list of the things that we're being accused of and let's talk about it, right? Are, are we in apartheid state? Let's talk about it. Are we occupying? Let's talk about it. Are we committing genocide? Let's talk about it. And, I, and I, not opinions, but, it, you know, indisputable facts, right? And Again, like I posted this a couple of hours ago, it's going crazy. Uh, people are translated into 20 different languages and it's it's going it's, And people have written to me like, I didn't know that. I just didn't know that. And so I I view that, that, that category of people as my target audience, the people that just don't know. The people that are on our side, great. I'll strengthen their, you know, their beliefs and I'll, great. The people that are gone are gone. There's no talking to these people who are yelling free Palestine. They don't even know where Palestine, they don't know anything, they don't know anything about Israel. They couldn't point to Israel on a map. Those people are, Right now, it might change, but right now those people are out of my reach. But then there's the people, I think it's a, a tremendous number of people that just don't know. They just believe things. They just don't know. And these are otherwise intelligent people. And so when I uh, distribute and I make sure that you know facts are accessible to them, I, I believe it's – I don't believe. I know it's making an impact, um, but you know, it's, it's a drop in the ocean. We got to keep going. Yeah, no, we definitely do. So you mentioned echo chamber – that's a great question. How do like how do we get out beyond our own echo chamber? Well, media? the question's a deeper question, which is, and and this this is a broad question of media in general, right? Not social media specifically, but media, right? The whole the whole mechanism of media is broken. If you think about it, right? There's a, there's an intrinsic paradox, or not? It's it's a mechanism that is broken because how do journalists get recognized by clicks, right? You get more traffic, you get a raise, right? Well, how do you get clicks by you know, publishing sensationalist and, and, and oftentimes inaccurate things, but it's what people want to see, right? And so you see some of these these titles, like with the horrible tragedy of a Jew being murdered on the streets of Los Angeles, and there was a title, Jewish man dies after hitting head at protest. Like, that's a thing that really got published. It's like, it's hard to believe. But let's be honest, if the, if the title would have been Palestinian protester murders Jew in cold blood, not going to get so many clicks, not really interesting which is absurd, obviously, to us, we understand, but the mechanism is broken. And so it needs to change. And the mechanism manifests not only in traditional media, but also in the algorithms of social media, right? These algorithms, what are they designed for? They're designed to keep us engaged. They're designed to keep us on our phones. Now, if my Twitter feed is all full of people that I completely disagree with and I have no, nothing in common with, then I'm closing my, my app and I'm throwing my phone away and I don't want to see it anymore. But if I'm seeing people that are, you know, making me feel, you know, validating my opinions constantly, then, oh, okay, I feel great, right? So that's what they're designed to do. And so it's a problem. I'm not going to pretend it's not a problem. It is a problem. The 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 best we can do is, you know, is, is engage, right? I mean, I, I often talk about this, the words social media, that phrase is a paradox, 
right? Because media generally is a broadcast, one way. Social is two way. So is it social or is it media? Most companies, most organizations, and most people focus on the media part. They're just broadcasting all day. But if you're social and you're actually engaging with people that are willing to engage, right, in in a real, you know, intellectual discussion, not name calling. Um, again, you have that discussion with one person, 50,000 other people watch that. You've now engaged with 50,000 people. So it's about stepping out of your comfort zone. It's about knowing the facts because that's the worst. If you engage, you don't even know what you're talking about. Knowing the facts, engaging and impacting one by one. That's how I view it, right? People are like, oh my God, but it's, you know, there's so many. Yeah, there are so many. So if you look at it that way, we'll never do anything. And that's true for anything in life. So the way I see it is one person that I convince is a, is a huge win. It's a huge win. Every single one of those people for me is a huge win. Look at it like that. And I think, you know, we'll all do our part. We really could. And again, going back to Ari, one person, millions of people, he, di- he didn't have anything that mean you don't have. It's a keyboard. We all have a keyboard. So, you know, people say, what can I do? Everybody can do something right now. Everybody. If you can't donate money, if you can't donate supplies, if you can't go visit people in the hospital, if you can, then open your, turn your phone on and, st- and tweet something with moral clarity. You know, if you can't do that, go hug your mother. I don't know. Do something. Don't just sit and consume, you know, the news, the horrible atrocities that are going to scar your soul forever. Don't do that. And it's hard not to do that. And I'm speaking for myself. You know what kind of efforts I had to make to not see the, the videos? They're all over my feeds. And anybody who sends them to me, friend or not friend, immediate block. Immediate. And I post it and I say, if you send me atrocities, you are blocked. That's just a hard rule because I am not willing to scar my soul. Unfortunately, it's a, it's like a drug. People are, you know, the curiosity, but don't do it. Don't do it. Focus on being productive. Focus on making an impact, make an impact. Yeah. You met, you mentioned this the other day when we were talking that there's, there's some influencers, they have millions of followers. They might post some things that might only get a couple hundred views or a couple thousand views. And what I took away from that was that even though I don't have that many followers, even if I do one you know, or two posts a week, it has the potential and the chance to reach so many other people and change the mind of even one individual. And, and so, you know, talking about getting out of the echo chamber, you know, there are way more Christians than Jews in the world, right? And there are so many that stand unequivocally, unequivocally with Israel, right? How do we reach our Christian uh, supporters, our Christian friends, and pull them into this digital media fight? It's a fantastic question, a fantastic question, because, you know, like I said before, one of our biggest challenges is that we're outnumbered, you know, massively. But if we bring in evangelical Christians and Christians that support Israel, now we're outnumbering everyone. Right. So it is it is something that, in my opinion, should be top priority. Now, I I actually yesterday, literally yesterday, did a podcast with a rabbi and a pastor. Like It's called Shoulder to Shoulder. And I was a guest on their thing. They obviously, you know, their, their target audience, many, many, many Christians. I know that there are organizations like Israel 365 that's very focused on, you know, bringing in our, our, our Christian friends uh, and helping us. So, so it's something that is being done, but it's something that we need to absolutely, you know, you know, up, up the speed and up the, the intensity because it's something that could help us win this war in a very real way. Um, so, so I, you know, other than the small efforts that I, as a human being, as one human being can make and the organizations that I know that are making, uh, I don't know how we can do this at scale, but it's something that I think should be top priority. And I think that we should allocate significant resources to doing exactly that, because that is, that can make the most impactful difference in this war, in my opinion. I, I think you just answered that. I mean, you, you said you just went on this podcast yesterday with this pastor and a rabbi, you know, I think all of us have Christian friends that we can reach out to, right? And we can ask them, and, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to reach out. I, mean, I, I just think that uh, uh, a, a rabbi, a pastor, and a tech blogger walk into a podcast studio sounds like the beginning of a joke. But uh, no, it was a it was a, it was a good conversation. And 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 I and I know you know I'm getting I mean thousands of messages from Christians around the world, you know, saying we're with you and Israel's going to win, and we you know the support has been unbelievable. And and I want to say something else, and this is really really important. I can't I can't really quantify it in a scientific way. Um, but I have a very, very strong inkling and a very strong feeling based on a lot of different data that the protests and the Ivy League colleges and all of the vocal noise making things that we see are the vast, they're the minority, not even by a little bit. I think the people and the governments and the, the populations that support Israel, the vast majority, not even close. Um, it's just that those guys make a lot more noise, uh, which is unfortunate, by the way, not, you know, discounting the importance of making noise, but 
I, you know, it does feel in many ways like we're alone because all the noise is that. But th- that's not, you know, social media when it comes to that is not reality. Reality is that the world stands with us with, you know, a very, you know, like Brett said, a, a, a very clear indication that we will now know who our friends and who our friends are not. But I do believe that we have the support of the world. I hope you're right. So a lot of a lot of folks had very specific questions on how they should use social media. So I want to ask uh, those questions so that we can make sure that we're being as effective as possible and making some good online choices. Um, so one, like when we want to share information, is it more effective to create our own content or share what others have created? What are the most you know what are the most impactful places and to post and and what should we should be how how should we be sharing it? So, you know, I think the most important thing is not to fall into the uh, analysis paralysis thing where you're just like thinking it has to be perfect. It, has to be per- it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. If you have a thought in your head, don't, don't dismiss that. Like you have a thought and that thought is, is a real thought. Share that thought. And so again, you know, X is, is such a low barrier, right? Open an X account and just, you just tweet. It's, you know, it's a short message. It's so easy to do. Um, and there's no need to share anyone else's. Don't need to think that way. You have thoughts, share them. Now, to complement that, uh, you, you, in addition, of course, when you get a beautiful video from someone or you get, you know, a fact or whatever, you know, my last tweet, I think about a half an hour ago was that I saw that the uh, spokesman of the IDF released some numbers. How many rockets were fired? It was 950 rockets fired from Gaza. I think 12% of them, I don't want to be inaccurate, a massive number of them landed in Gaza where there's no aerial defense. Um, and it talked about where they came from, from hospitals, from mosques, from whatever. And that's those are you know hard facts, evidence based facts. And so I I posted that. So I got that information from someone and I posted it. Right. Um, so it, it could be a mixture of my own thoughts as a human being, which again, people are like who cares about my thoughts? That's 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 fundamentally wrong. And again, Exhibit A. What did I ever do? All I do is share my thoughts. Right. So don't dismiss the, the fact that you have thoughts and you have insights. Share them. Uh, and again, compliment them. Yes, compliment them with with you know, information that you're getting from reliable sources, because that is, you know, a huge, you know, trap to share something. Oh, that, that sounds like a cool fact. I'll share that. And it's like, that was not true. And then you just killed your credibility. So be very careful with that. But I think a good mixture of my own thoughts and other content that people are sending me or that I come across, uh, whether it's an article, an image, a video, whatever it is, right? Uh, and I think that you should figure out what your message is, right? What is your message at the end of the day, right? These two things that I just mentioned have to serve a message. And that's true in the business world as well, right? Like what, what am I trying to own, right? Uh, and so figure out what your message is. Your message, we're going to win this, we got this. Okay, so then, you know, promote content, share content that supports that, you know, I don't know, narrative, right? Or is my, uh, you know, is my narrative that, Look how much everyone hates the Jews. I would not recommend that being your narrative. But if that's your narrative, then go find, you know, the, all the anti-Semitic stats. Okay, not a very good idea. Is your narrative, there's a double standard? Okay, I'm not sure what I think of that, but the double standard exists in a very real way. So bring evidence to support that, you know, that, that narrative. But first and foremost, on a strategic level, ask yourself, what what is my mess- what is the message that I want to get out? I said in the beginning, my message is, here's accurate information in real time, and here's hope. That's my those two those are my two kind of messages in this war. Figure out what your message is, and then you know share content that supports that message. So it sounds like you're encouraging everybody to start posting, right? Because we are outnumbered, and so uh, it's great to share content. But it yeah, but like but it's... let's not be scared of like the posting word. Like, what am I going to post? Who cares about my? Th- don't don't think that way. Like, just think of it like I'm writing my own diary. No one's even reading it. Just like. Do I have a thought? Share it. Obviously, make sure you proofread. Make sure it comes off professional. But don't be a, don't be afraid of this 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 big word. Oh, I got to share content on social media, but I'm not an influencer. I'm not a content creator. Forget that. You have thoughts. You're a human being. There's there's not a human being on planet Earth that doesn't have thoughts. All right. You have insights. Share them. That's it. It's it's so, remove that barrier. Like jump over that. It's it's. I understand the hardest part is starting, but just start. And again, I'm not telling you to go, you know, open an Instagram account and start creating graphics. And no, I thought I'm, t- I'm not telling you to open a YouTube account and start buying professional cameras and edit. No, take your keyboard on your phone or on your computer, open an X.com uh, 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 account and start typing. That's it. It could not be any simpler. It is extremely easy to do. And there's no reason not to do it. Again, be very careful, though, because people are reading and you, you don't know. I mean, there's videos going around of some Israeli woman. I don't know who she is, but at some point, I don't know when she said it. She she made this gesture at 
Arabs, I guess, where she went like this, we're going to kill you all. And, and like everyone's sharing that video. Who is this woman? I'm sure she didn't think that she's going to give the entire Jewish people a bad name because she made a stupid gesture, which was stupid, irrelevant of anything. But now she's she's caught serious damage. So be very careful, right? Because one wrong word and 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 things are easily taken out of context. So be careful, but but share your thoughts, share your thoughts. And you know what? Truth be told, if if after everything I just said, you're still scared, okay, fine. Then go and amplify other people's thoughts. Follow people that are spreading a good message. Just retweet them. You don't want to share your own thoughts? I think you should. But if you don't want to, then amplify others' efforts. Go in there, share their tweets, share their posts on Facebook, whatever it is, and let their message get to a wider audience. And, you know, it is very important to emphasize also that the echo chamber that we talked about before is a problem. But if I share something, let's say on LinkedIn, and it's a good message, a clear message, not a controversial message, and someone shares it, their audience is no longer my echo chamber. Their audience might be a completely different audience. I have now reached a new audience. Everyone on my LinkedIn post is getting hundreds, if not thousands of shares. Many of the people seeing those posts are absolutely not in my target audience or not my echo chamber. They are hearing things for the first time they've never heard before. So let's not forget that. And you know, when you share good content, it gets shared. That's just the way social media works. I think that's a great point. And we, we also have to realize that it's not just the non-Jews that need to see this content. There are a number of Jews that are more sympathetic to Hamas and the Palestinians, which is surprising, but it's a reality. And so even though within our own families, you know, and, and our own personal network, we know these individuals, I, you know, we might think you're in your own echo chamber, but you're not because there are Jews that need to see the reality and start seeing the light. I mean, you're, get, you're getting my blood pressure up when you talk about this. The guy, this makes me, I cannot describe to you, this infuriates me. It really, you know what? Like if you, if you're a liberal Jew in America and you sided with the Palestinian narrative pre October 7th, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I can maybe, you know, sympathize maybe now after what happened, you're not taking your brother's side. Like, I mean, talk about lack of like a like talk about moral bankruptcy, right? Um, but you know, it, it, again, we have to put it in historical perspective, and I don't want to get too biblical on you here, but we have to remember, you know, we talk about Egypt, right? We were enslaved for 210 years, and then we left Egypt. Nobody talks about this. Do you know, Sean, that 80 percent of Jews didn't leave? Didn't leave. 80 percent of Jews left stayed in Egypt. Didn't leave. 80 percent. I mean, it's crazy. In the desert, we were going to, into Israel. God literally split the sea for us. He did all these miracles. We sent in 12 spies. 10 of them came back and said, don't go in there. Let's stay in the desert. Like, this is what we do. This is what we do. And every single, you know, exile and every single country, we try to out, you know, out German the Germans, out Greek the Greeks. And who are the most liberal people in America? It's the Jews. We always do this. Um, and, and I think... It's it's tragic. It's really it's it's horribly it's it's heartbreaking to me. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, we got to do what we got to do. We got to continue spreading the positive message. And and I and you know, I I a hundred percent can tell you that uh, I've had people comment on my post saying, you know, I am a liberal, you know, Jewish uh, American who stood by Palestine, and now I am standing by your side. So there are people who are changing their tune, but but it but the, the phenomenon of I don't, I don't know if to call it self-hating Jews or what. I mean, at this point, you can't, you can't not call it that, right? I mean, these are people that are supporting what Hamas did. It's, it's terrible. It's absolutely tragic. So it's a surprise and shock to all of us. Well, this is, this has been really helpful, Halal. It sounds like the two things, correct me if I'm wrong, that you'd like us to do is one, sign up for an X account once we get off this webinar, and two, create our first post. That sound about right. Yeah. yeah. Elon Musk is giving me commission, by the way, and every sign up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I, listen, I, by the way, that's I have to I have to just mention, I'm, if I may, a lot of people have pushed back on that because they say Elon Musk, he's an anti-Semite. And I'm not going to get into the debate or not. Is he, is he or is he not? But I, I would recommend anyone that thinks that to go examine the facts. Uh, the facts are that pre-war, uh, I don't know, a month and a half ago, Elon Musk held a space, which is like a podcast on Twitter, with the entire, like the, the most influential Jewish leaders in the world. He spoke unequivocally against anti-Semitism, about, you know, wokeism on the campuses, and he, it was unbelievable. And I can tell you on a personal level, I have managed to remove um, probably by now a thousand accounts from Twitter X uh, of, of anti-Semites. And I got to tell you, three Elon Musk days, Jack Dorsey, who was the previous CEO at Twitter, two CEOs ago, 
wrote me personally. He wrote me personally. He said, I see how much abuse you're getting on my platform. We're going to handle it. He didn't handle it. He didn't do anything. So, you know, do I agree with everything Elon Musk says or thinks? No. And that's not the topic right now. But I, I but I promise you, and this I can tell you because if you look at the, no, the data, you know, doesn't lie. The man has done good work for us, the Jews, on X. There are mistakes. There are bad people that still exist. And there are anti-Semites there. It's true. But you have to understand that, like, when we're talking about hundreds of millions of people, things are going to fall through the cracks. And he's doing the best he can. I do believe that. I do believe he absolutely loves Jews. He said, he said like, I have more Jewish friends than I have non-Jewish friends. He's like, he's going to go visit Auschwitz. Like, he's not the way people view him. He's really not. I've never met him. But that's my impression based on the, the data that I have. Um, and so, I, yeah, I do I do think at the end of the day, just to sum up everything that I'm saying, X is where the conversation's happening. X is the most influential. And to top it all off, it's also the lowest barrier to entry. So it's really win across, win-win across across the board. Thank you, Hillel, so much. This has been incredible and incredible insights. You've, been, you've obviously provided some great advice that we all can put to good use. So, And you've also given us a clear direction on how to join the digital army and make an impact online. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, I also want to thank Michelle Alkin, Mark Katrick, and the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Museum of Tolerance for making this webinar possible. And I want to recognize a few of my fellow members for Entrepreneurs for Israel who are leading so many incredible initiatives. Sarah Dre, Oren Green, Jason Glazer, Danielle Menachemson, Sejo Lakani, Ami Kassar, Effie Barkaspi, and Nir Zavaro. If you'd like to learn more, please visit, please visit our website at withthejewishpeople.com. And watch your emails for the announcement of our next webinar speaker next Thursday. Please always reach out with any feedback or ideas. I love seeing those emails coming through. So I'll close with this. You know, I really hope that this webinar inspires a fresh perspective in you and motivates you to take a meaningful steps in your life. After all, wouldn't it be wonderful to know you're positively shaping history? Thank you and see you next week.